there anything that was done for the indigenous community by having this land acknowledgement? Is there any actual benefit to including this title card at the beginning of this special, aside from Anna Gadsby letting us all know that don't worry, she agrees with the message. As far as I could tell, no. That brings us to the actual special itself, and I am pleased to report that uh, at no point during the special does Hannah Gadsby just start yelling and screaming at the audience. So I guess there, it's, it's already an improvement from the net. But with that said, it's still clear that even though Hannah Gadsby is actually making jokes in this special, she still absolutely has a chip on her shoulder about cis-hetero-Christian patriarchy, or whatever you want to call it. There's actually this bit at the beginning of the special where she discusses uh, her marriage to her new wife, and the fact that their wedding cake was actually a shark cake with two otters, not because they have any specific affinity for sharks or otters, but because their goal was to trick a Christian baker into making them a wedding cake as, as a lesbian couple. We wanted to trick a Christian baker into making a gay wedding cake and it, it worked. It's like, nah, mate, that's not a wedding cake. I'm turning 10. Easy, so gullible. Believe anything, Christians. Oh. <laughs> now, so he's going to hell. Uh, you we've all got to do our bit to get through this gay agenda. Um, sending Christian bakers to hell one at a time. You've concocted a scheme in which the success has been that you've given money to someone who does not support your lifestyle. Huge win. Bravo. And it's also evident early on in the special that uh, Hannah Gadsby is concerned about climate change and actually views it as a mass extinction event. I know this because this is these are just things she says, not even as part of a joke or anything. They're just statements that she makes on stage. I do want to acknowledge that the world is ending. I don't want you to think I'm oblivious. I'm not. I've clocked it. We're done. We're cooked. We're cooked. But the thing is, I don't think I can solve it. Not tonight. Not. Not in the time allocated, so I'm just going to ignore it. And just for the next hour, we're going to feel good together, and then we can head back out there and be the mass extinction event that we are. So yeah, even though there is at least comedy and jokes here, if you were hoping for something non-woke, non-preachy, and apolitical, I would say definitely look elsewhere. And I will say, having actually trudged through the entirety of the special, which is over an hour, you guys are welcome. Please like this video if you appreciate my efforts. It does seem at the very least like the social commentary is kind of front-loaded. Uh, after you get through the first maybe 20 minutes of the special, it becomes a lot more normal. She talks about things like having to deal with her social awkwardness as someone who does have autism. Also what it's been like being married and like having her wife meet her parents and just kind of more general life stuff. So while I wouldn't say that Something Special is my favorite comedy special, uh, I can at the very least say that it is my favorite Hannah Gadsby special for that reason. With that said, if anyone was keeping up with Hannah Gadsby during kind of the pandemic and specifically the time surrounding Dave Chappelle's Netflix special, The Closer, and all of the controversy that caused, you may have been surprised that there was a third Netflix special for Hannah Gadsby at all, because after Dave Chappelle released his Netflix special, Gadsby actually came out and very publicly and very vocally criticized Netflix for platforming Chappelle. After her second special, there was a question as to whether Gadsby might make more for Netflix due to the firestorms created by other comedians, namely Dave Chappelle, but also Ricky Gervais, for their transphobic humor. In 2021, Gatsby addressed Netflix chief Ted Sarandos bluntly on social media, F you and your amoral algorithm cult. The following year, they reached a new deal, paying Gadsby not only for this special, but also for a forthcoming LGBTQ comedy showcase. So on the one hand, Gadsby is happy to slam Netflix for daring to platform Chappelle and Gervais, but on the other hand, she's also clearly okay with taking their money. How exactly does Gadsby reconcile these two stances, you might be wondering? Well, she's been quoted as saying, in a notoriously transphobic industry, I am looking to broaden the scope of opportunities for genderqueer performers from around Around the globe, as well as expand the diversity of offerings to audiences on one of comedy's biggest platforms. It's also written that in an interview with Variety, Gadsby acknowledged her change of heart was strategic. If you want to change the conversation, you still have to be a part of the conversation. I don't know. I feel like there's an argument to be made that perhaps Gadsby's something special is as much of a virtue signal as the land acknowledgement that starts the show off. That's basically all I have to say for now, though. And as always, I would love to know what you guys think. Uh, 
Have you forgotten about Hannah Gadsby? Did you watch The Net? Did you watch Douglas? Are you going to watch something special? And do you think that Netflix actually expects to make money on Hannah Gadsby material moving forward? Or is this just their way of kind of balancing out having edgier comedians like Dave Chappelle and Ricky Gervais and that they can say like, yeah, we have these people that make transphobic jokes, but Hey, Hannah Gadsby makes jokes about men. Therefore, you know, we can do both. They, they cancel each other out. Let me know down below. And if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Until next time. Someone asked Natalie Portman how gay the new third movie is. <laughs> so gay. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy it. So let's talk about Taika YTT and why he's... He's kind of the worst. So you guys are probably familiar with Taika Waititi for his work on two Thor movies, Thor Ragnarok and Thor Love and Thunder. Now Thor Ragnarok was very positively received and it also made a ton of money. Thor Love and Thunder, however, I mean, it did end up doing kind of okay at the box office, but overall, a lot of people, myself included, weren't very impressed with it. And I did do an entire review of Thor Love and Thunder. If you haven't seen it yet, I recommend you check it out. But overall, I thought the movie was just kind of everywhere. And I, I'm a fan of humor, and I think a lot of people enjoyed the humor that was part of Thor Ragnarok, but with Love and Thunder, it was almost like Taika Waititi wasn't trying to incorporate humor into the movie. It was more he was making fun of his own movie. And now I'm not a huge fan of the Thor comic books, but from people who are, there were also a lot of complaints that with that film, Taika Waititi was simply disrespecting the source material. But overall, with that kind of lukewarm reception attached to Thor Love and Thunder, it was ultimately decided that Taika Waititi would not be returning to direct the next Thor film. This has been presented to the public as like a mutual parting of ways, but I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if I were a Marvel executive but I was looking at what people were saying about the movie and I was looking at the box office receipts compared to how much that film costs. Honestly, I would just not give that guy a stab at another film. And the reason why I bring all of this up is because we now have this piece from Variety that says Taika Waititi had, quote, no interest in directing a Marvel movie, took Thor Ragnarok because he was poor and it was a great opportunity to feed his kids. Now this article just came out and it's been going kind of viral and for good reason. To be clear, if you are not familiar with Taika Waititi's career outside of Thor, he's actually best known for directing and writing pretty small independent comedy films. I mean, some of his most well-known works include things like What We Do in the Shadows and of course, Jojo Rabbit, uh, both of which are very different from Thor. And now, obviously, if you think of Marvel, it's not everyone's cup of tea, but still it's a very prestigious franchise and certainly a very well-funded franchise. So to have a director say, eh, actually, I wasn't really into them. I kind of just did it because I had to. It's just a strange look, never mind the fact that to me, at least, it just doesn't seem like an appropriate thing to say about people who you used to work with, that you actually didn't want to work with them necessarily. It was more that you just, you had to because you had bills. We're gonna be looking more at these quotes and why I think if you're part of any fandom, uh, the last thing you want is Taika Waititi within a hundred foot of that property. But first, I do wanna let you guys know about something really cool, which is that the Blind movie is now available for purchase on Blaze TV. So for years, Hollywood has been lacking when it comes to stories of redemption. Movies and TV shows have trended toward the anti-hero, the flawed person who makes no effort to change, it just becomes worse and worse as the story goes on. But here's some great news. The Blind, the true story of the Robertson family is now available for purchase on Blaze TV. Because you see, maybe you've made a mess of your life. Maybe someone you love is in a dark place. Maybe all of the above. If you or someone you know feels beyond redemption, you need to watch this movie. You'll see there is always hope, always. You see, if you're not familiar with The Blind, the story takes you on an incredible journey through the life of Phil Robertson, you know, the guy from Duck Dynasty, giving you an intimate look into the man behind the legend and the trials, the triumphs and the values that have shaped him throughout the years. And while the blind wasn't actually a blaze media production since phil is such a big part of our blaze tv family we wanted to make sure you had the opportunity to stream it on blaze tv but here's the thing because it's not actually ours we can't include it as part of your blaze subscription but if you'd rather purchase it and stream it here rather than apple and amazon we wanted to make sure the opportunity was there so act now don't miss out on this opportunity to own the blind a phil robertson story on blaze tv you can buy it today at blaze tv.com the blind for 19.99 
That's blazetv.com slash the blind. Now let's hear more from this interview that for some people has proven that yeah, Taika Waititi, not only is he ungrateful, but he was also just a terrible choice to be the director for Thor. Regarding Thor, YTT is quoted as having said, you know what? I had no interest in doing one of those films. It wasn't on my plan for my career as an auteur, but I was poor and I just had a second child and I thought, you know what? This would be a great opportunity to feed these children. And Thor, let's face it, it was probably the least popular franchise. I never read Thor comics as a kid. That was the comic I'd pick up and be like, ugh. And then I did some research on it and I read one Thor comic or 18 pages or however long they are. I was still baffled by this character. And YGT even went on to say about Marvel executives bringing him onto the project. I think there was no place left for them to go with that. I've thought, well, they've called me in. This is really the bottom of the barrel. Okay, so there's just so much to unpack here. And yeah, some people are saying that it's great uh, to have Taika YTT be so unfiltered and transparent, which yeah, uh, we could say that. But if you ask me, this is overall a bad look because like I said, Marvel is a pretty big deal in Hollywood. And I'm sure there are hundreds, if not thousands of directors who are very qualified, who would have killed to have an opportunity to direct something like Thor Ragnarok or Thor Love and Thunder. So to hear Taika Waititi basically say that he didn't want the project, but that he felt he had to because of the money. I mean, if I were another director who would have gladly taken that role, I would see that as a slap in the face. And overall, I think when you're in the entertainment industry, whether you're a director, a writer, an actor, or even a singer, because it's such a competitive field, if you are given these big opportunities like Taika Waititi has been given to look at them with such cynicism and honestly ungratefulness i mean it does come across as very out of touch and that now brings us to the fandom side of things for a while now a huge complaint of people who actually grew up reading marvel comics is that it seems like the people who are now charged with adapting the comics into tv shows or movies they, they don't actually care about the source material they're more interested in telling their own stories and they're just simply using a marvel skin suit to be able to do that because hey they would love the existing fan base and popularity, but it's, you know, they're not actually that interested in the comics themselves. And for the most part, the access media and industry insiders have basically dismissed those fan concerns as, you know, being sexist or racist or just like incel nitpicky behavior. But here we actually have Taika Waititi admitting that, yeah, he's actually, he's never been interested in the comics. All of this was just a paycheck. And actually, he never liked Thor in the first place. I mean, can you get any more disrespectful? And I know reading this interview, especially in light of the news that Taika Waititi won't be returning to direct another Thor movie, uh, you might be inclined to think, okay, maybe he's just going out of his way to burn bridges with Marvel because maybe he's mad about how things turned out. I'm getting a vibe that the intention here was actually to just give a middle finger to the fan base. This article also reports that, quote, I know that I won't be involved, YTT said about Thor 5 directing duties. I'm gonna concentrate on these other films that I've signed on for, but I love Marvel. I love working with them. I love Chris. I would never feel like they are cheating on me, YTT added noting he'd have no ill will if Marvel went ahead and hired another writer-director for a fifth Thor movie. We're an open relationship, and it's like if they want to see other people, I'm happy for that. I'd still get back in a bed with them one day. Okay, so YTT loves Marvel, loves working with them, and certainly seems like he loves their money. Really, it's just, it's Thor. He's not that interested in it, I suppose. Which I mean, it's fine. He can have that opinion as a person and as a director, yes. but if that's the case, maybe don't take charge of two different Thor movies. Like you can understand why fans of Thor who actually think it's a really cool character uh, don't like to hear that. And this isn't the first time, by the way, that YTT has kind of gone mask off with his disdain for the source material here. Back in 2019, actually, he got a lot of flack after on Twitter, someone had posted, it is due to your market Marvel work that this mess is possible. Your writing ruined Thor, his mythos, and his character. So no, I do not want to see this film if we are truly getting a Jane Foster Thor. To which YTT had responded, I'll ruin your mythos in a minute, baby. Taika, why do you have to be like that? Like, why, why would you have to do that? Even if the movie was just a paycheck to you, for the fans out there who really like this character, could you not have at least put aside your own ego and your own aspirations for a single project to try to deliver something that the fans would actually like and embrace. And this actually brings us to the next project he will likely be ruining, and that is his upcoming Star Wars film. Recently, he's been quoted as just coming out and saying, frankly, that his film will, quote, piss people off. So that just, I mean, 
seems like it's coming along great. And in case you're still wondering, by the way, how much or how little uh, respect Taika Waititi has for the Star Wars property and franchise, let me also remind you that previously, according to Natalie Portman, he actually asked her, I guess while they were filming Thor, have you ever wanted to be in a Star Wars movie? Now, it's nice that I guess Taika Waititi and Natalie Portman got along so well that Waititi also wanted Portman to be in his Star Wars movie. However, this is a pretty big red flag because if you're at all familiar with Star Wars, like I didn't mean at all, you will know that Natalie Portman has actually been in not one, not two, but three Star Wars movies in, in, a, in a pretty big red starring role, actually. But apparently Taika Waititi forgot about that. He just kind of forgot that Natalie Portman was Padme. And now I'm not a Star Wars fan. Perhaps previously I might've considered myself one, but certainly not now. But if I was one, I would be very concerned about how this project is gonna turn out. That's basically all I have to say for now though. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Until next time. What's it like to learn math on brilliant.org? Brilliant gets you hands-on to help you learn by doing. Learn topics from everyday math to calculus and beyond. You'll solve fun problems and learn from clear and intuitive explanations. Brilliant has thousands of interactive lessons in math, science, and computer science, because studies show that interactive learning is six times more effective than watching lecture videos. With over 10 million users around the world, Brilliant is the best place to learn interactively. Get started for free at brilliant.org. Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction, and today we're going to... During a snowstorm in 1982, a man on board a commercial plane looked out of his window and saw something very strange at the top of a Colorado mountain. When authorities were alerted and sent to that spot on the mountain... Today's story has two significant plot twists, and one of them comes at the very end. So make sure you stick around to hear the entire story. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once or twice every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer to detail the like button. Quiet little town called Milstadt, Illinois. Milstadt is home to about 4,000 people, and had it not been for Ashley Reeves, only those 4,000 people and their friends and family would even know that Milstadt existed. In 2006, Ashley Reeves was a 17 year old high school student who lived with her parents and her younger sister Casey in Milstadt. Ashley was an excellent student who, even though she was over a year from her high school graduation, she was already thinking about what colleges she wanted to go to. She was also extremely likable and outgoing and she had this huge infectious smile and so in the front two seats of Sam's car Sam is in the driver's seat and Ashley is in the passenger seat and while they're sitting there something happens that causes this huge fight between the two of them and at some point Sam tells Ashley to get out of the car but Ashley refuses she wants to talk to him she wants to deal with their issues but Sam's not having it and so he gets so mad at her that he lunges across the center console of the car and he puts Ashley into a vicious chokehold now he tells police his plan was to kind of yank her out of the car but he squeezed so hard around her neck that he heard this loud popping sound coming from her neck it was the sound of her neck breaking. And so as soon as he heard it, Sam let go and Ashley kind of crumpled forward and hit the front dashboard of the car. And so Sam is staring at her, wondering what he should do. He's kind of looking around, making sure no one saw what he just did. And then he reached over and lifted her back up to see if she was still alive. And he saw she was, but instead of trying to get her help, event that today's story sounds exactly like an urban legend it sounds too exaggerated too grotesque too terrifying to be real but it is this is the true story of the detsevki park maniac 
But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once or twice every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer to help build the Like Button's new dresser they just got from Ikea. And as soon as you open it up, immediately find all the screws, strip them all, and then leave. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. Moscow, Russia, which is one of the world's richest cities, is home to more billionaires than any other European city. But if you travel just 10 miles south of Moscow's richest neighborhood, the Golden Mile, you will reach one of Russia's poorest neighborhoods, the southern Moscow suburbs. Nicknamed Zhopamira, which means the soul of the world, these suburbs used to be a thriving neighborhood with tens of thousands of working class Russians and their families calling it their home. But after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, the money and the jobs in this area dried up completely. And even though the residents wanted to relocate and live somewhere with more opportunity, they couldn't. They didn't have the resources to leave. And so they were trapped. And since 1991, really nothing has changed in these suburbs. Today, there are still tens of thousands of now very poor Russian families that still live there, living in these totally overcrowded Soviet apartment buildings that are these big, square, identical-looking things that are literally falling apart. And most of the people who live in these suburbs either are unemployed or they work some dead-end job that barely pays them any money. The police in the suburbs are completely underfunded and, for the most part are corrupt and so crime over the years has really taken a dramatic uptick also drug and alcohol abuse are completely running rampant in this part of the world but despite their notoriously rough living situation in the southern moscow suburbs these residents do have one claim to fame and that is the bitsevsky park Vitsevsky Park is comprised primarily of a massive, lush green forest that is full of wildlife and beautiful streams and clearings, and it sits right on the southern the edge boys. of the southern Moscow suburbs. In total, the park covers a whopping 2,700 acres and stretches four miles from top to bottom which makes it three times bigger than New York City's famous Central Park. Vitsevsky Park had always been a popular tourist destination for people living around Moscow, but after the fall of the Soviet Union, the park's popularity skyrocketed specifically amongst people that lived in the southern Moscow suburbs. As their lives continued to become more bleak in the 1990s, they compensated by going to the park as much as they possibly could. They would take long walks in the woods, they would play chess with their friends along the peripheries on the park benches and tables, or they'd go cross-country skiing in the winter. Basically, year-round, this park became their escape from their miserable everyday lives. But that would not last. Starting in the early 2000s, something totally unexplainable and terrifying began happening in the park, specifically in the heavily forested area in the park. And eventually, this thing, this unusual event that was taking place, got so completely out of hand that the residents of the southern Moscow suburbs stopped going in the park. They were literally too scared to go inside. The strange phenomenon began in 2001. From May to July that year, 10 people went missing after having been spotted either in or right around the outside of the heavily forested area inside of Bitsevsky Park. All of them were alone when they were last spotted, and all of them were men. Now, there was some precedent for people suddenly going missing in this part of Russia. Every now and again, people would try to flee the suburbs or try to make a better life for themselves somewhere else, but time and time again, they would just come back a couple of days or weeks later lab. because it hadn't worked out. But when these 10 men did not come back in a couple of days or weeks, their families went to police and reported them missing. 
But unsurprisingly, the police did not launch an investigation. Instead, they accused the 10 missing men of just being drunk bums who probably wandered off somewhere and whatever trouble they were in, it was their fault. Now, the families and the locals did not buy this explanation, but there really wasn't a better explanation. These men really had just kind of vanished. No one had any idea where they went. And so given the kind of general grim outlook on life that lots of people held in this area, people just kind of accepted that whatever happened to these 10 men happened and there's nothing any of us can do about it. And then they moved on. But in October of that year, so two months after the 10th man had gone missing in the park, another man went missing in the park. And then by the end of the year, four more men had vanished inside of the park. And all of them vanished under the same circumstances, last spotted alone in or around the heavily forested area in the park. The families of these five men would go to police, they would report their family members missing, but again, the police did not launch any investigation and blamed the missing people for being responsible for whatever happened to them. And then after that, the families kind of mourned the loss of these five men, not really sure what to make of it, and locals kind of gossiped about it for a little while and started to speculate about what might have happened to them and kind of lumped them in with the 10 other men that had gone missing. But after a while, when no new news came out about what happened to them, everyone just kind of moved on again. And unbelievably, this pattern would repeat itself for nearly four years. From 2002 to late 2005, 25 more people would go missing inside of Bitsevsky Park. 24 of them would be men, one of them would be a woman, although it wasn't clear if she was actually in the same category as the other 24 men, but regardless, that put the total number of mysterious disappearances inside of this forested area in the park up to 40. But still, the police shrugged it off, and eventually, so too did the local population. Everyone just kind of moved on, like this phenomenon wasn't happening, that people were not going missing in droves inside of this forest. But everything would change with missing person number 41, because unlike the previous 40, this missing person would be found again. 63-year-old Nikolai Zakharchenko was a retired police officer who lived in a tiny apartment in the southern Moscow suburbs with his family. He was a classic Russian tough guy who chain smoked cigarettes and drank lots of vodka. And even though he was well aware of the missing person phenomenon inside of this park, that wasn't about to stop him from doing the thing he loved, which was going on walks inside of this park. He figured whatever was out there, he could handle it. So one evening in November of 2005, Nikolai told his sister that he was gonna go out for a walk in the park. But that night, he didn't come back. And so his family was very worried about him, but they decided they would wait until the next morning to see if maybe he showed up. But the following morning, when Nikolai did not show up, his family went to the police. But per usual, the police did nothing. A few days later, a local was walking fairly deep inside of the forest inside of Bitsevsky Park when they noticed well off.